Good morning, St. Paul's, and welcome to worship. Today is Palm Sunday, the day that we begin Holy Week with Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. If you do not already have your at-home worship resource with you, I encourage you to pause the video now, head over to the St. Paul's website or check your email or the Facebook page, open that PDF so that you can follow along in worship. This morning, we are graced with the music of our music minister, Nick Scafidi, and his daughter, Katya. We also have a special reading from St. Paul's member, Casia Carter, and we have Nancy Day as our assisting minister, sharing the prayers of the people with us. It is good for us to be together in this way when we cannot be together in person. And so I invite you at this time to take a deep breath, prepare your heart and mind for worship, and we will begin with our hymn, of procession where we would usually carry our palms on Palm Sunday, all glory, laud, and honor. We continue with our confession and forgiveness. Take a deep breath, plant your feet firmly on the floor, maybe open your palms. We confess. Gracious God, have mercy on me. I confess that I have turned away from you knowingly and unknowingly. I have doubted your promises of resurrection and new life. I have failed to love your people as myself. Forgive me, O God. Forgive our world as we struggle with how to follow you in this time. Turn me back to you, O God. Renew my heart and spirit. Remind me that I am your beloved child, a recipient of your unfailing grace. In Jesus' name, amen. This day I proclaim to you that God loves you, God knows you, God has forgiven you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O God of mercy and might, in the mystery of the passion of your Son, you offer your infinite love to the world. Gather us around the cross of Christ and preserve us until the resurrection through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. At this time, we have a special reading from Casia Carter. I was young then, a girl still at home in the care of my father and mother, in a little farm on the town of Bethpage, near the Mount of Olives, not far from Jerusalem. 
I was just old enough to wonder about the ways of the world, to wonder and not understand, but still, I was sure that someday I would know. I was caring for our animals in the morning in the new light of the dawn, giving them their morning feed in our manger and refreshing the water trough. My favorite was our donkey, a gray beast with friendly eyes who smelled of dust and straw and whose coat was scratchy and warm. She had just had a baby colt not long before and her baby was fresh and wobbly. They both knew my steps when I would come and then would nuzzle up to me for sometimes for a treat. I always had something ready for them, sometimes some fruit or some sweet grasses from up the hill. My donkey belonged to my father, but in my heart, she was mine and her colt too. I was getting ready to take them out to the field to be with our flock. I tied her to the post by the gate while I gathered the rest of what I needed for the day. I tied her colt beside her. As I went back to the house, I looked back and I saw some dust kicked up as two men approached our laneway and came near. They approached our donkey, my donkey, and untied the lead as if it was their right. They began to lead my donkey away and her colt with her. Calmly, with purpose, I ran to them and told them to stop. That's our donkey, I protested. But then I felt a hand on my shoulder. It was my father. He looked to the two men and they looked to him. They exchanged a meaningful look. They said, the Lord needs them and will send them back. And my father nodded his head as if this had all been arranged beforehand. And perhaps it had been. It sure felt like that to me. Why else would my father have parted so easily with them? My heart leapt and I felt like I was part of something important a secret adventure. And so I nodded too, giving my permission for the donkeys to be led away. Maybe this is it, I wondered. Maybe this is the day. Maybe this is the day that starts the big change we've been waiting for. Maybe my donkey was part of the big dream that my father and his brothers and cousins and well, everybody in town had been talking about the dream which would get the Romans out of Judea and give our land back to the Jews. There had been a lot of talk lately about whether to trust that prophet from the northern province, this Jesus of Nazareth from Galilee. Was he the one, the Messiah, our savior? Would he rout the enemy, redeem us from our disgrace and let us taste freedom again? Was this the day? I decided to follow my donkey. I told myself I was just checking up on my donkey and her colt, keeping them safe. So I trailed a safe distance behind, watching and wondering. The two men brought my donkey and the colt to a large group gathered not far from the Mount of Olives, perhaps a dozen in all. A few of them removed their outer cloaks and laid them on my donkey's back, and they helped one man get on her back. I supposed this must be the master that the two men were talking about. A crowd was beginning to gather, and I got the sense that wherever he went, a crowd was always beginning to gather. There was something about that man. I crept closer, but not too close. I looked for signs that he was a strong warrior, if he was the one. I looked closely, but as far as I could tell, he didn't carry a sword. He seemed comfortable enough on my donkey, and they slowly began to make their way towards Jerusalem. Up ahead, I heard someone holler, Hosanna to the son of David. And the path before him was cleared, the way they do for a processional when one of the Romans of rank and file pass by. Except this time, it was for one of our own. And we were making way not out of fear, duty, or obligation, but out of some sort of wild hope. People laid their cloaks down and branches from the trees so that the feet of my donkey, his mount, would not touch the bare ground and, and dust would not cloud the vision of the man. When the Romans rolled, rode into town, they usually had war horses and chariots. But... I guess this Jesus didn't have access to that kind of pomp for his procession. 
you just had my donkey. I hoped it would be okay. Hosanna to the son of David. The shout from the front became, became a chant on all sides in front of Jesus and behind him on both sides of the street. I started chanting it too. It was energizing and exciting and I wondered what it meant. I continued to wonder, who is he? Is he the one? Is this the day? What is this salvation that he brings? Will he be okay? What will happen to him in Jerusalem? I saw this, the chief priests, stiff-backed and walking with hard, strong steps, convening in a corner, glancing with fear and frustration and anger over at Jesus. I felt my stomach tense in fear on Jesus' behalf. Then I felt that familiar hand on my shoulder again. It was my father. Come now, he said. Let us be on our way. And so we went through the temple gates, untied my donkey and her colt, and led them home. We walked in silence. The path was strewn with broken palm branches, and the sides of the road were well trampled. The quiet seemed almost deafening, and it seemed as if I could hear the echoes of our hosannas shouting out from the stones on the ground. The sun was beginning to go down over the hills. The day was nearly done. And from within me, my many questions, my deep wondering had only begun. We join together in our gospel acclamation. I will play it through once and I invite you to Sing the second time through. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you, God, for this day. Open us to your word. Open us now. All together, that is, thank you, God, for your word. Thank you, God, for this day. Open us to your word. Open us. Now we pray. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you, God, for this day. Open us to This is the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 21. Glory to you, O Lord. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what the Lord had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble, and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, 
This is the prophet Jesus from Galilee. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. This week we find ourselves in the midst of a loud crowd, in a large city wrapped in questions, shouts of Hosanna, and the author tells us, turmoil. We move into the holiest week of the year for Christians all over the world, accompanying Jesus and his disciples to Bethphage, a city near the Mount of Olives and near Jerusalem, where in a few days Jesus and his friends will go to a garden and Jesus will be arrested. This story is the beginning of the week. This Sunday, Palm Sunday, the first step into the holy days leading up to Easter. So often this reading from Matthew, this proclamation of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, is overshadowed by the Passion narrative. In many churches around the country, the service this day begins with a procession of song, palms and shouts of Hosanna, but ends with the story of Jesus' death. But I notice that when we move so quickly from palms to passion, we lose some of the symbolism, some of the political theater that Jesus is producing here on the first day of the week. You see, my friends, in the story this morning, Jesus is putting on a show, poking holes in the Roman Empire by making a spectacle. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem would have reminded the citizens of a grand military procession, making a particularly exciting entry. Generally, this parade, called a parousia in Greek, would have made clear how powerful the empire was. In Jesus' day, these parades were often around the time of Passover, marking the governor's entry into Jerusalem for the celebration, which nearly quadrupled the population of the city during the holiday. In her blog, Journey with Jesus, theologian Debbie Thomas writes, the governor would come in all of his imperial majesty to remind the Jewish pilgrims that Rome was in charge. They could commemorate an ancient victory against Egypt if they wanted to, but real present day resistance, if anyone was foolish or daring enough to consider it, was futile. This is the scene Jesus is poking fun at, the tradition he is well aware of. And so Jesus rides in on his donkey, entering the city, from the east, while the governor Pontius Pilate enters the city from the west. As people spread branches and cloaks on the road, ironically putting on a show to shame Rome. Jesus rode into Jerusalem with his ragtag group of followers, the Son of God, on the back of a nursing donkey with her colt trailing behind, as Debbie Thomas notes, in an effort to reveal the truth about worldly power and the ultimate truth about God. I wonder, friends, what truths would be revealed by Jesus this day? What narratives we place our hopes in? Where are the pilots of our world riding into the city on a steed displaying might and dominance? In these past weeks, many things have been revealed about the state of our society in the seats of power. We've seen great economic upheaval, the plight of hourly workers laid off from service jobs, the toil for little pay of those at the front lines, the shortage of face masks and safety equipment in a country with huge stockpiles of medical equipment and even larger military stores. We can see in these times the places where we put our hope, the dominant narratives in the world around us, those things that are called into question by a global pandemic forcing us to notice what is uncovered and seek the truth in the middle of it. I do not say these things to cause you more pain or more challenge in an already challenging time, but rather to point out the ways that our society, not unlike the society Jesus came to, places our hope in the powers of this world and relies on them to save us. The fervor with which people have sought to bolster the economy, even at the cost of human life, the ways in which people have hoarded what others need, seeking to sell to the highest bidder. These things have revealed something about our culture, the way a Messiah on a donkey revealed something about Rome. But in this gospel story, 
in these times of great confusion and turmoil in Jerusalem, in a time when folks have been taught to place their hope in the power of empire, Jesus comes, riding on a donkey. And somehow, the hope of the people is transformed. Somehow, the Holy Spirit gathers the community on that dusty road in East Jerusalem, breaking into their consciousness and causing them to become aware of the fleeting nature of those places they put their trust, and turning them back to Jesus, the source and ground of their being, the one who brings with him the power to save, riding on a donkey, just as his mother had on a journey to Bethlehem all those years ago. Jesus takes the symbols of power and might, and he transforms them with humility and truth. Jesus uncovers the absurdity of empire and in its place enacts a reign of love, riding not on a war horse but a donkey, bringing the kingdom of God near, a reality without the trappings of power over others, without a need for military might or weapon stockpiles. Jesus is giving this community a glimpse into God's preferred future, the world as it could be, a peaceable kingdom built on God's dream of wholeness for everyone. In these days of disorientation in our own contexts, I believe Jesus is coming among us even now and transforming our understandings of what it means to be alive. In place of the market as God, in place of a person's worth being related to their productivity, in place of isolation for competition's sake, I have seen the Holy Spirit sowing seeds of a different kind. I have seen people sharing in the ways they can. The sidewalks and windows in my neighborhood filled with encouraging messages. Boxes of mac and cheese left in a little library in front of a neighbor's home. I've noticed folks understanding their identities in new ways beyond their employment and economic productivity. And perhaps you have noticed this too. This sort of transformation that God is working in the face of something terrible, in the face of great turmoil, sowing seeds of hope that will grow and flower, producing the good fruits of love and humility, truth, and interdependence. This year, as we begin Holy Week, as we cry, Hosanna, Lord, save us. I am convinced that our Lord Jesus is is saving, is revealing, is knitting us together into one body through which we receive consolation, grace, and mutuality. None of us know how this is going to turn out. We know it will be easy, that there will be much loss associated with this time in our world, in our country, and in our families. But we can rest assured that God will be with us and that God will continue to reveal those places we have invested our trust and hope and will empower us to let go, to relax into the grace of God in which our world is simply drenched. Amen. We continue with our hymn of the day, which can be found in your worship resource, Jesus, Keep Me Near the Cross.
Let us pray. Turning our hearts to God, who is gracious and merciful, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. God of mercy, awaken your church to new proclamations of your faithfulness. By your spirit, give us bold and joyful words to speak, that we sustain the weary with the message of your redemption. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. God of mercy, quiet the earth where it trembles and shakes. Protect vulnerable ecosystems, threatened habitats, and endangered species. Prosper the work of scientists, engineers, and researchers who find ways to restore creation to health and wholeness. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. God of mercy, drive away fear and anger that cause us to turn against one another. Give courage to leaders who seek liberation for the oppressed. Bring peace and hope to those who are in prison and those who face execution. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. God of mercy, send your saving help to all who suffer abuse, insult, discrimination, or contempt. Heal the wounded, comfort the dying, bring peace to those suffering chronic or terminal illness. Tend to all who cry out for relief. We pray especially for Donna Kitzman, mother of Tim Kitzman, and for the family of Barbara Day, Steve Day's mother, as they mourn their loss. Let us commend Barbara Day to the mercy of God, our maker and our redeemer. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. God of mercy, we pray for all who will prepare and lead worship in this holy week. In all things, show us the ways that you call us to die to self, to live for you, and to give ourselves for the sake of others. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. God of mercy, God of life, we thank you for the birth of Madeline May, great-granddaughter of Wayne Rewalski, born on March 31st. Bless her and her family at this joyous time. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. God of mercy, when we breathe our last, you raise us to eternal life. With all your witnesses in heaven and on earth, let us boldly confess the name of Jesus Christ, our resurrection and our hope. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayer. According to your steadfast love, O God, hear these and all our prayers as we commend them to you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by God's Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In this time of physical distance, we are not celebrating communion at St. Paul's. Sacraments are embodied communal activities that we celebrate when we are together. In this wilderness time, it is important that we abstain together, that we notice other places where we receive God's grace and hope, places like remembering our baptism every day by making the sign of the cross, remembering that we are beloved by God, that we are made new and forgiven each day. Other places we receive grace like mutual consolation through a phone call, a friend, a card, maybe a hug from someone in your home. These are ways that we receive the grace of God in community, even in times when we are apart, even in times when we are not practicing Holy Communion together. I invite you, if this is a challenge, to call me, talk about it, or maybe to look closely at scripture. 
to notice those stories, maybe in the second half of Exodus, those wilderness stories, when God provides what the people need in ways that they do not expect. It is my prayer that there will be other ways we receive water from the rock and manna in the wilderness during this time apart from the Holy Communion table. And I pray that you will feel God's spirit with you even in this time. And now, may you be reminded that you are beloved by God, that you are a good creation, that you are God's child, that you are blessed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, my friends, this week we will move into Holy Week on the internet. If you are interested in more information about what we'll be doing together at St. Paul's, you can check the St. Paul's website, stpaulsmilwaukee.com. That's all spelled out, S-A-I-N-T, paulsmilwaukee.com. You can look at our Facebook page. You can check out our YouTube channel. You could call me or email me. If you're on our mailing list, you have received this information in your email um, this is a holy time, and we will be celebrating Maundy Thursday via Zoom video conference. Um, Good Friday, we'll be right back here on our YouTube channel or on Facebook in a video form. And Easter Sunday, we'll worship together at 10 o'clock on Zoom video conference. Both of those Zoom services will hopefully be simultaneously cast to our YouTube channel. God be with you. These are strange days, and God is so present. Amen. <laughs>